exposing people to what we're finding here with some research that we've been digging up or, or local case studies and this type of thing. And so my assumption here is that you guys know something about dual pole and using it in winter weather. This is not going to be a review. Maybe some of the things will be a review for some of you, but more or less I'm trying to take uh, the science here and stretch it out and, and take us to the next level of utilizing the dual pole radar uh, in weather, weather, winter weather situations. So that's what we're going to be doing here. And uh, so I'm going to go through uh, about eight different uh, things here. Some will be case reviews. Some there's just not enough data that we've uh, gotten yet. So most of it, some of that will be literature review uh, with some uh, images from that. So uh, without further waiting, we'll just get right into this. Um, so the first type, the first thing we're going to talk about here is uh, precipitation type transition areas. And back a few years ago, we had some of the airport folks over here. And uh, what we found when we were uh, asking them, you know, how can we better serve you? What, what can we do to, to help you with your operations? They told us, some, told us some very interesting things. The first one is that they need to have forecasts of precipitation type transitions within a half hour accuracy, plus or minus, of when we expect that to occur here at the airport and every other airport that we serve. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the reason is is that if they get behind or apply these uh, chemicals and whatnot that they put on these airports uh, outside of that window, it can become very, very costly, and we're talking tens of thousands of dollars at an airport budget. And so, uh, if you have a smaller airport like we have here, say at Mid Continent here in Wichita, where only eight percent of our traffic is is commercial and, and most of it is business traffic. You deal with a lot where that really uh, grabs into their budget pretty quickly if, if we start forecasting things that uh, are pretty bad. So uh, the other thing to understand here is that when you're dealing with airports, it's not like they get out there like the Department of Transportation does and they just plow it over to the side. Or, or I remember when I was up in Wisconsin, you'd get two feet of snow and they try to melt it all. But... Um, what they do is they, there's a very regulated, regimented way that they have to go about their business. So they have to have those runways completely cleared off all the way to the side. There has to be a certain amount of chemical. It can't exceed so much because then they get into this uh, other, they get into the regulation troubles. And the same is with the de-icing. So I don't know if it's that, that way across every airport that the people I'm speaking to, but basically they need a very specific forecast. So that's one thing that we found when we were looking at that. So this here is just a case of uh, a transition uh, from kind of a drizzle, freezing drizzle area toward uh, a snow event as it moved across the forecast area. And you can see here uh, with the white blinking line west of the radar uh, that actually extends north and then extends west to southwest uh, from the RDA. You can see if you look at ZDR, which is in the upper right panel, and correlation coefficient, which is in lower right panel, you can see obviously there's a definitely a transition of, of precipitation type in there. And <clears throat> whereas if you look at the uh, legacy uh, just reflectivity in the upper left, I would argue that it's difficult to say where the transition area is. So dual pole really gives us some specificity here. We're looking at transition areas moving across the forecast area. So it's really helpful when we're trying to deal with the aviation customers and, and whatnot. And just to, to highlight some of the things here, uh, out in this area you'll see east of the RDA, there's uh, a great area of um, noisiness here in the ZDR. And you'll see the same thing down in the lower right in the correlation coefficients. And you'll actually see correlation coefficients out from the radar above one, and that's pretty common when you get into drizzle and freezing drizzle situations. So just look for that signal as well um, as you uh, analyze your radar uh, data. This here, again, is just a summary of what we were just talking about. We get improved precision as far as what we're, we're trying to forecast, uh, especially when we're talking about transition of precipitation types. Our next... Uh, item up here that we're going to discuss is the melting layer. And the melting layer may seem outright pretty simple. And some of you may have seen this, this uh, example here that I'm presenting before, because I have presented this example before. Uh, but, but there's some very interesting things that you can glean from just analyzing your melting layer. In this case, we have an area of precipitation uh, across 
east-west across where the RDA is. And if you look here in the upper right where the ZDR is, you see ZDR values drop to near zero. They're dropping to near zero in that east-to-west transition zone. So I would argue here you would probably be getting some kind of a cedar feeder or even a saturation of the lower levels of the atmosphere uh, because the sounding, which I'll show here in a minute, is quite dry in the lower level. So you're actually observing the saturation occurring in the lower levels of the atmosphere. As you see, the ZDR values converge towards zero, so you're transitioning more toward a, a snow-type um, scenario here. And you, you can see that here in the correlation coefficients as well in the circled area. You can see that uh, the, the correlation coefficients are approaching one over time near the RDA in an east-west fashion, meaning that the precipitation is changing over to all, all snow because outside of that is the, where the melting layer is. The melting layer is actually right here near the surface. So uh, that's really something you can observe here. Uh, if I go to the next slide, uh, something that's also very interesting is uh, I've got I highlighted here in black where the melting layer was at the beginning of the loop that we were just looking at. And just assessing that, you'll see that the, the melting layer is actually converging toward the surface. So if anything, you can say, well, maybe I'm getting surface cold advection. Maybe I need to look at my uh, environmental data to try to get a better understanding of what's occurring. And dual pole is just one piece of that puzzle that just help us cl uh, clue into maybe there's some transition going on that I really need to assess using my situational awareness. So it really does help in situation awareness tools and uh, moving forward uh, in our assessment using the melting layer. Well, if we go and look at this again, uh, this is a little later, this case, you'll see the same type signal here from east to west, uh, same with ZDR and in the correlation coefficient. And uh, again, the melting layer is descending further. They did get a three-inch band of snow in this area here from east to west. And one thing that I also wanted to show you is if we look up at 1.5 degrees even, you'll see an area that's even larger here uh, in, in the uh, correlation coefficient depth-wise near the surface at the RDA and also in the ZDR. So you'll see that perhaps this does indicate there's some kind of a, of a uh, precipitating down into dry air and saturating, which is occurring with this case. And that actually is what occurred with this case, um, as I just showed you the result. And so I could summarize this, and, and I, I've just put this in the res into the presentation so you can look at it later if you're interested. But one thing I wanted to point out here was where the, the uh, this is the zero line that I've highlighted. And you can see, it's hard to see, but in this area here, the, the sounding is above uh, freezing. So over time, it did wet bulb down to uh, around freezing level, and so or around zero zero Celsius, so you did get a lot of snow in that area, and, and it does show that, okay, we had some cloud ice here, and it did precipitate down into this drier area, a drier layer throughout the day, so that's that case. Um, the next subject matter I'll talk about is uh, something that's relatively new that's in the literature, and that's uh, pristine ice crystals, and some of the literature that, that I've reviewed suggests that uh, when we start seeing these and more often in the storm, it suggests uh, the demise of the storm is underway, and they looked at a number of cases, and they've seen this signal in quite a number of them. So what, what's going on here is they observe these, and you can see uh, if this has come up on your screen yet, uh, where the red arrows are pointing, these, these areas of pristine ice, where they occur, where there's relatively low or, or very low reflectivity. In ZDR, the ZDR values are quite high, and the correlation coefficients are, are below one, so there is some uh, pristine ice crystals there, and uh, you start you start seeing these m more commonly. I mean, I've a view, I've seen them a few times in the storms that we've the one or two storms we've had down here this winter. But uh, you start the the theory is when they went and and looked at these cases, they start seeing these more often, especially on the periphery of the precipitation areas uh, north here of the RDA when the storm is undergoing a demise. So I can't vouch for how good this is. I haven't really been able to utilize this yet. It's just something that the the research has, has community has, has published. I just wanted to show some of the things out here that are out there and perhaps use them and you put them in your back part, your pocket and uh, use them as a tool uh, in the future. Here is one case. Yeah. 
Uh, sorry about that. Question for you. What, how low Z are you talking about reflectivity values for okay. that to show up? Uh, on this... Uh on this next slide that I just forwarded here, the the the, the Z values are uh, less than are 10 dB in the 10 dBZ range, five to 10 dBZ here. And this is just okay. southwest of the RDA here. If you're looking at it, the RDA here is at Wichita, and uh, if, just southwest of the RDA here, where this black area is, is uh, highlighted, do you see that? Do you yes. Think? Okay. <clears throat> that that area there, you're only getting uh, Z values of around 10 dB. But you do see an area that's pretty, pretty marked here in the uh, correlation coefficient and in the ZDR that could be pristine ice. So I just wanted to point that out as a case that we had here, and uh, so you could see what it looked like in, in non-published uh, literature. So, and if anybody has okay. any questions, please feel free to just go ahead and stop me and ask. I, I really don't mind. I want this to be more of a facilitation and discussion than than anything else. So. Yeah, thanks, Ken. I had a question about that. You know, one thing one thing I've been noticing here, and I don't know if it's just maybe a local issue, but when we start getting reflectivities below 10 dBZ, we really start, it seems like a lot of times, I'm guessing, signal-to-noise ratio issues where we just get a lot of noise in the um, in the dual-pole, you know, products, and, and, and uh, I'm just less inclined to trust them. Um, you know, 10, 10 dBZ sort of seems to be the magic number, but but I don't know if that's if you've had similar experiences with that there or not. Well, I I can just say that because we have Vance Air Force Base uh, dual pole, which is not too far from us, and, and these types of features, I, they're trackable. I mean, I could uh, track them with both radars, so I was pretty confident in this, but uh, I think one thing when you're dealing with this type of thing, especially in, anyway, in winter weather anyway, and I can't really say much about the convective season because I've not seen that, and this, I think this is mainly a winter weather phenomenon that in the lower levels where you would see this is uh, you start dealing with aspect ratios of these of these crystals, so it starts uh, causing different things within the uh, uh, dual pole products. So just keep that in mind. Uh, some of these. Uh, do, the ZDR in this doesn't also is influenced by uh, crystal density and these types of things. There's not a lot of talk about that, but the, the aspect ratio of these crystals does affect ZDR, and that's at least in this case here that I'm looking at is what occurred. So I can't really say that I've seen a lot of those issues that you're you're perhaps talking about um, here, but uh, I would just try to assess them with a secondary radar that's near you. I, I know you probably don't have many around you, but but to see if these things are trackable and that type of thing, and that's that's basically the only thing I could suggest for you. Okay, thanks. Okay, the fourth uh, thing that we're about halfway through, uh, I'm talking about here, is the precipitation type and uh, refeeze, the refreezing signature here. And uh, some of the things I, I just wanted to say here with this image here on the on the lower right is uh, here we have a melting layer. Uh, that's rounding the uh, old away from the RDA pretty far here, and that's pretty clear uh, in all the products. You can see that in reflectivity and ZDR and correlation coefficient down the lower right. But uh, the other thing I want to uh, show was inside of that was the secondary bright band, if you will, or a refreezing signature, and this is characterized by a decrease in the the ZDR or I'm sorry, an increase in the ZDR and a decrease in the correlation coefficients. And uh, so that's, that's, uh, it might be a little bit counterintuitive, but again, you start dealing with this, uh, this aspect ratio business and, and how things are, are handled by the radar at that point. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, when you're trying to assess this, just look for the, the, this refreezing signature in the, in the ZDR. And again, know your, your environment. It's, it's pretty Im important here. And, uh, so I just wanted to point this one out here. What, what happens here in this case, just to explain it here, is that um, you get these highly non-spherical particles, which are presumably ice crystals, and, uh, and that's what's going on in this area here. So we're thinking that in order for ZDR to become higher in this case, which you would expect it actually to be, go lower, is be, because of your introducing uh, locally generated ice particles 
below this melting layer in the refreezing area. So that's something that's pretty new uh, in the literature. They talk about that. So I just wanted to point this out again operationally, just how to look at this and, and look for it on your radar. There's also ways now with the with the depolarization to identify uh, weak convection during uh, winter weather situations. And uh, this, this you can uh, look at this image here. Uh, there's depolarization streaks here north uh, and even perhaps east, but mainly north and south of the, R of the RDA in this image. And here's the reflectivity for the same uh, data here on the, on the left. And so <clears throat> if you just look at the ZDR, you'll see these uh, depolarization streaks. And these are caused by charge separation from weak convective updrafts in the winter clouds. And uh, I can elaborate that perhaps here in a, a little bit. And what, basically the growing uh, experimental evidence with this is that the weak convective updrafts in these winter clouds are capable of, of generating uh, sufficient electrical fields which may orient these low inertia uh, crystals near the tops of these updrafts. And so what can happen here is these oriented crystals they'll usually cr cause these pronounced uh, effects of the dual polarization. So that's really what's going on uh, you know, when it's affecting the propagating radar wave. So in this case, that's what we're seeing here with this uh, type of thing. So operationally, if you're assessing a winter storm and you start seeing these, perhaps you're dealing with uh, some, uh, your radar isn't going crazy, perhaps you're dealing with some weak uh, convective updrafts uh, in these winter clouds, and, and just keep that in mind when you're, when you're doing your forecasting uh, in, in the near and now term. So identifying drizzle, and I did talk about this a little earlier. And uh, here's another case here where uh, we had a precipitation type transition across the area. And again here you'll see this flashing white uh, area east of the precipitation to the west of the RDA. I'm looking at the, at the area east of the RDA where the arrow is. And what I'm trying to highlight here is where the ZDR is quite noisy here in the upper right. And you'll see that, the uh, again, the correlation coefficient is, is uh, pretty uh, low near the ground. But above that, it's above 1. And so uh, with this case, again, we're looking at drizzle. And, and again, uh, we, I've seen these, these uh, type of signatures a number of times with drizzle. And typically with drizzle, you get a lot of... Uh, 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 noisy returns anyway in the ZDR and in the correlation coefficient. And mainly that's due to this very small drop size. So, uh, you know, in the legacy, you typically get this light precipitation that's, that's happening near the radar, and we could, we could usually see that in the past. But now we have other tools that will help us uh, at least see that on radar. You know, obviously we're going to look at observations and see that, but we also know how good some of these observation systems are at uh, observing drizzle. So. Uh, just another tool. Here's another case that we had here with a, a transition area moving across the forecast area. Uh, behind the white line here was a snow area, and that's where actual cloud ice was being introduced into the sounding. Uh, and you can see here the ZDR is also showing that to the, to the uh, west of that line. And you can see, again, the same type correlation coefficient. And the ZDR signature actually is the same, too. The color curve didn't show up quite that well in here. But it is quite a bit noisier than the ZDR behind this uh, highlighted line here. So uh, again, it's the same type signature when you're out looking at this. And what, what really helped here is, OK, yeah, I can look at my water vapor imagery uh, and the IR and this type of thing and try to assess where my cloud ice is. And I should do that. But also, now I have a radar confirmation to even more precisely help me do that. So that's something that's really important here that, that dual pole gives us here in the winter. The uh, seventh and next to last thing that I really want to talk about here, and this is the, perhaps the most exciting thing that we've been looking at here in the last uh, few months, is the dendritic growth zone. And so what the literature says here so far is that there's an increase in ZDR and a decrease in correlation coefficient in the uh, dendritic growth zone as the ice particles grow and this type of thing. And that's becoming pretty well known. It's partially due to a change in the aspect ratio because you're growing uh, dendrites at an incredibly fast rate, uh, relatively speaking. And so that's, that's what uh, we're looking for. And we're also getting a slight enhancement in the uh, KDP here. And that's what the literature says. And so now I'm going to look at a few cases here. First, I'm going to discuss what's actually occurring, what we've seen here in the vertical. So we're looking at a plane here, and we're looking at uh, the top of the atmosphere, if you will, or the top of where we, we're going to look at here. Uh, and then down at the bottom is going to be the surface. So that's what we're looking at first. And so where these red lines are, well, that's where the dendritic growth zone is. So initially, 
we have ice crystals with irregular shapes. Uh, we have a ZDR that's not that's a non-zero ZDR, so it's it's somewhat positive. Correlation coefficients are near one because all the crystals are uh, are uniform. As they fall down into the dendritic growth zone, we get ex ex explosive depositional growth. Uh, most of them are dendrites, some plates. But uh, anyway, we're getting very large cri or crystals growing at a very fast rate. And so our ZDR, our KDP, they start to go up, and our correlation coefficient uh, starts to decrease as we get this rapid growth. <clears throat> Once crystals fall out of the dendritic growth zone, aggregation process starts. So what that means is the crystals are starting to, the, these dendri dendrites are starting to uh, coalesce, come together, become these large clumps of uh, big snowball type things falling through the atmosphere. They start to stick together. As this process starts, there is a brief continued ZDR and KDP increase, and there is a brief decrease continuation in the correlation coefficient. However, as that process continues with further aggregation, the flakes become fuzzy because they're getting into these larger you know, um, <clears throat> clusters of flakes, so the ZDR and the KDP decrease, and the correlation coefficient increases to near one. And so what we're looking at here is that our dendritic growth signal on, on the 88D here with dual pole is in this area here. It's towards the bottom of the dendritic growth zone and right before the uh, aggregation starts. And this is typical, not all the time. Don't use minus so-and-so temperature as the cutoff. We don't want to do that. We just want to think about what the process here is and the spectrum of probabilities. Below that is when the, the aggregation signal is in this white area. And that's when the snowflakes become fuzzy because, again, they're becoming these, these large balls of, of uh, coalesced snowflakes. And then uh, outside of that, which we've noticed, is this pristine ice crystal or, or perhaps non-aggregated stellar dendrites that still exist outside this, which, which if you look at a radar beam here coming through this whole spectrum of mess here I have on my screen, we're looking at a, uh, a bounded area of aggregation. If you just look at that, if the radar is going from right to left and you're looking at a radar beam, you're going to run into a signal of some kind of non-aggregated stellar dendrites or pristine ice, then an area of aggregation, and then an area of the dendritic growth uh, signal. So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at these cases that I'm going to look at here in just a moment. Here's the, again, just to introduce you to, to have these side by side, here's the dual pole signal for the dendritic growth here that's pointed out by the red arrows. You can see that higher area of, uh, of uh, ZDR here in the upper right-hand panel, and you can see the reduction in correlation coefficient in the lower right. Now, when we start getting into the aggregation signal, that occurs right below this, uh, Z, the dendritic growth signature here. So we're getting, again, correlation coefficients go toward one. The uh, aggregation here drops the, uh, the ZDR to near zero. And if you'll look at the surface very closely here, there's, there's heavy snow. And be, again, below that, if we continue to look, there is a slight, in this case, area of, of higher ZDR and lower correlation coefficient that is bounding this, oops, excuse me, that is bounding this area of aggregation. So that's something we want to look at. One thing that we've noticed with these cases is that the stronger the bounding, perhaps the higher the, the uh, SLR. So let's continue on here. So why care about this? OK, that looks nice. Who gives a rip, right? So dendritic growth zone, we all know this, and you know, it means enhanced snow growth, increased snow ratios, and that, that type of business, increased snowfall rates. Uh, but now that we have a tool here with dual pole, we can actually observe these types of things. And when we see this bounded aggregation area, we have seen very high snow to liquid wa uh, water ratios. So that's what we're going to look at in the next uh, couple of case studies here. One here is, is a case, uh, it was the uh, Christmas Eve blizzard of 2008 or 9, just a few years ago. And uh, this is down in Norman's area. And here is the dendritic growth signal here that's pointed out by the arrow. And uh, again, uh, that was just the case that we just looked at here, just looking at it. This here area, again, is where the dendritic area is in the case. I just wanted to blow this up so you could see it a little better on your screen. Again, here's the aggregation. And then again, here is the, uh, the again, the uh, non-aggregated stellar dendrites, pristine ice in this area that's bounding it. And you can sl slightly see it down in the lower right on the correlation coefficient.
This is a case, and I, the next few cases, I want to thank uh, Dan on the cross a lot for helping me out with uh, giving me these cases and, and having a really good discussion with these. And so uh, here we have a case that occurred in, in the forecast area up there, uh, between there and, and the, the Chanhassen office, it looks like. Um, it look, here, there's an area in the upper left-hand corner of heavy snow that's occurring here on the radar. Now, in the upper right here is the dendritic area here just uh, up here where it's highlighted. Um, and I have that blinking through my slides here. I don't know if the slide will keep up. But, but whatever the case is, we have an area of higher ZDRs, and that's where the den dendrites are growing rapidly. Down uh, in correlation coefficient below that, you'll also see that the correlation coefficient drops uh, below one, and, and you can see that quite well in this image. Now, uh, below that dendritic signal is where the heavy aggregation is, is really occurring, and you'll see just below that how this is bounded, uh, w which is what uh, we were just talking about. This uh, area where ZDR drops to down near zero and correlation coefficient goes up to one is where the real heavy aggregation is occurring and where the high snowfall rates and ratios occur, and in this case, um, in this uh, heavily aggregated area here, the, the SLRs are 25 to 1. So, again, if you're sitting there on the radar and you're a forecaster, you can look at this and assess what you have in the forecast and understand, okay, maybe I need to either my forecast is you can reassess your forecast more or less. But this, this again, this is a really good signature of this, uh, this bounded area of the aggregation, if you will. Hey, Ken. Yeah, have you been able to look at like one of these the dendritic growth, growth zones through like a cross section? That's what I'm going to next, Phil. What a segue! <laughs> awesome. Okay, here's the FSI cross section, and uh, thanks, Phil. And I'll uh, show here what we're looking at is the area of uh, intense precipitation, and I'll show you that here on the lower left of the FSI cross section. And, uh, and you can see where that cross section is here in the upper left. And the dendritic area is highlighted with the minus 12 and minus 18 Celsius uh, line here. Uh, here is an uh, analysis of the ZDR cross section for the same area. And uh, this is really taken through part of the heavily aggregated area. And you'll see, just like we saw on the other radar shot, the uh, bounded area of aggregation. So again, uh, this is uh, what we're looking at here. Uh, if we look at the lower left, you'll see the area of heavy precipitation outlined where it was in the cross section. Above that is the stellar dendrite area uh, of, of, he of uh, very strong dendritic growth. Below that cross section is where the strong aggregation is. And east, if you will, and west of that, just in this cross section, well, I guess literally too, is the area of uh, pristine ice and uh, perhaps a non-aggregated stellar dendrite. So this is a really good uh, case where you can see that in, in the uh, horizontal when you're looking at a plane on the radar as well as in the vertical here with a cross section. Does that uh, help you there, Phil? Yeah, that's great, thanks. All right, great. Um, one question. Um, what's the width on this really heavy um, aggregate, aggregate? The aggregation, how wide is it? I'd say uh, it looks like to this to be 25 to 30 miles. Any other questions right now? Yeah, Ken, this is Matt. On your cross-section, you seem to have a pretty narrow area of the the high ZDR above the lower ZDR, you think that might be a little bit wider because it's only covering about a third to a half of that the snow band itself where you had the heavier snow. Yeah, it, it very well could be. Uh, if you moved uh, yeah, the cross section to the east some, you would uh, probably have a wider area. Um, but uh, one, one thing with this uh, cross-section, we wanted to uh, see what was happening actually south of that aggregated area because that's something that really um, hasn't really been studied, and we wanted to uh, really take a look at that and see actually what was going on there. So, okay. But you're right. If we looked at the aggregated area, well, you would see a wider cross-section there um, down the lower left. Okay. Hey, hey, Ken, this is Dan. Can I add something? 
Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. I I think what what it seems when Ken and I have been talking about this, and, and, and for some weird reason, I was chosen to have a lot of dendritic cases this winter. It's like almost every case, and we're expecting another one tonight. But it seems like what we're seeing in the ZDR is the lower the ZDR go, uh, becomes, the more aggregated your dendrite crystals are. So the bigger the clumps of those aggregates. So right where we have the AG in the cross section there are probably your biggest clumps of dendrite crystals. So probably like 30 to 50 dendrite crystals are clumped together in, in maybe a one-inch diameter aggregate falling down. So that's giving you your massive, uh, your higher snow ratios, you know, in the 30 to 40 or 50 to 1. And, and that's in the heart of your vertical motion. And so then as you work your way away from that, your ZDR drops off, off to the blues, which are like from 0 to like 0.5 or so. So you're, what the idea in my mind is that we're losing our vertical motion outside the heart of that band. So the vertical motion is decreasing, and our stellar dendrites aren't aggregating quite as much. And so as you move another layer away from that, you start to get into higher ZDRs, which says you're going back to just the plain crystals and away from the aggregates. Because the aggregates, when they group together in those big clumps, they, they appear round to the radar. So as you go towards more just stellar dendrites, and away from the vertical motion max in the middle of that, that band, you get more towards just those crystals. I don't know if that helps visually. It's, it's kind of like you have to almost peel layers. To me, the heart of that band, you're looking at the heart of the vertical motion uh, and, and the most aggregation. And so that, that ZDR min is right where the center of your band is, of vertical motion. I don't know if that clears it up, but that's kind of my conceptual model of it. Hey, hey Ken. Um this is Suzanne. Um, I have a question. Uh, I mean, I don't know if all your cases are in similar um, uh, instability environments, too. Obviously, this is not a one-size-fits-all. I mean, that's going to, that's going to vary the, the width of your band. Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't know. That's something else that people have to consider that, you know, this might, might be... Uh, appropriate for the, the uh, instability that was in place for this case, but it could vary, obviously, in another environment. Well, that's true. I mean, but, but I think that when we are, like Dan was saying, we're looking at here with the aggregation, we're assessing really where the max vertical motion is. So, yeah, if we have uh, high levels of instability, we're probably going to have uh, more uh, vertical motion because we're looking at instability above an area of forcing. And so we're probably going to have more vertical motion, which is probably going to have more aggregation. So um, I think what we're doing here is assessing uh, probably a symptom of what is actually occurring. So if we have the um, a large area of forcing for ascent with uh, instability above that, you're getting a lot more vertical motion, which we will probably see on the radar as a larger area of aggregation and with lower ZDRs. Okay, thanks. I'll go back to my, my role. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll move on to the next case. Again, if we have any, uh, this is great discussion here. Looking at the correlation coefficient, this basically verifies what we're looking at uh, on the ZDR. You'll see uh, north uh, of the, the RDA again, what we're looking at uh, where the stellar dendrite area is, lower ZDRs as well as where the pristine ice is, or I'm sorry, lower correlation coefficients, as well as where the pristine ice is. And then right where the aggregation is, again, you're going to see this area of uh, correlation coefficients near 1 because we're dealing with, with these aggregated uh, snowflakes that have, have turned into these, these ball-type, uh, uh, you know, snow-falling uh, particles. So that's what we're looking at here with uh, correlation coefficient. This is the uh, verification as far as the SLRs here with this case, and I'll let it come up on everyone's screen here. Basically, a lot of the areas here had greater than 20 uh, to 1 SLRs with some as high as uh, 28 to 30 here across the heavier uh, aggregation area. So again, th this uh, where the aggregation is, is uh, just like Dan was saying, where the, the highest vertical motion is, where you're going to see that signal on the radar with the lowest ZDRs 
high correlation coefficient, which would then translate to these uh, areas of high SLRs. Here's another case that just occurred uh, around that area uh, last Wednesday, it looks like, uh, where we had, uh, again, a very large area of aggregation annotated by the red arrow with ZDRs down near uh, zero. And you'll see in the reflectivity, this, this uh, high area of reflectivity in the same area with correlation coefficients near one. And again, this aggregated area is, again, bounded by these higher ZDRs of where the stellar dendrites may be and pristine ice. So this is very interesting to see this signal uh, as an indicator to uh, perhaps assess things more in your environment. It also shows you where what's really happening now to see, uh, you know, maybe you need to make updates to your forecast. It's a great situational awareness tool. With this case, uh, SLRs so far were 85 to 100 to 1. It was really crazy with this event um, because there was one to two and a half inches of snow with this case and only a few hundreds of liquid. Um, so why? Well, let's look at the sounding here. Uh, you have a deep area in the dendrite layer, perhaps uh, all the way up, uh, perhaps 400 millibars deep here. So um, in this area here where the uh, snow fell, you had a very deep area of, uh, of ice crystal growth uh, to allow uh, these things to grow at an incredible rate for a very long time. And we've found with cases where you have uh, crystals with a very long residence time in the dendritic growth zone, uh, you have very high, uh, very high, anomalously high uh, SLRs. And in this case, we're able to see that. We're able to use dual pole radar perhaps to get, uh, when we go back and look at that, uh, where the area of uh, the highest SLRs were, where the highest aggregation was. That's where the heaviest precipitation is, max vertical motion, these types of things. So again, you're able to pinpoint these things with more pre precision if you're part of the forecast. And here's some verification that uh, Dan sent here with very large uh, snowflakes falling. Uh, I found this rather humorous, if you know Dan. <laughs> but again, uh, this is a photo from Platteville, Wisconsin, with very large snowflakes up to an inch in diameter. Um, and uh, they had some reports of that from uh, various TV Mets. So again, it verifies what we're seeing on radar, large aggregates, which means high snow ratios. So the last thing I want to hit on um, is a situational awareness, and I, I can't beat this drum loud enough or long enough. And really, again, at knowing your environment, uh, I can't stress if you notice when we were looking at all these, we had the standard environmental data package loaded. I think that's critical for understanding what it is you're looking at and knowing your environment. Again, look at your IR stuff for cloud ice as well as forecast soundings, uh, you know, and, and assessing your microphysics. And use dual pole to verify and explain some of the things that you're seeing uh, or observing in the environment, or perhaps to give you a tip on what might be occurring if your forecast is going awry. So uh, that's really all I have. I just want to thank uh, the people involved. Uh, this is, again, just some of the reviews of what we discussed here. And uh, since we're 44 minutes into the thing here, I'll, I'll uh, stop it there. One thing I did want to show was this uh, website that I've put together and uh, on our internet and what that is is basically everything we've discussed today and a nice uh, website that your forecasters can review and look at in case they uh, you know how it is when you see a lot of these things you perhaps forget them or, or you know but anyway this is a nice uh, area where you can go find things you can zoom them up if you click on them it, uh, you can zoom in on them and uh, see what's going on with them so I just wanted to uh, plug that. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, please, uh, you can contact me at any time. I'm certainly here to help anybody who wants it. Um, I'm by no means the expert on all this, but I'll do the best I can to help you out. And really, that's all I have. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll have a field any questions if you have any. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time to show us that today. Okay. Any questions uh, for Ken? Any discussion? Ken, this is Ron. This is a nice presentation. I appreciate you working on this presentation very much. Uh, nice eye opener. Appreciate it. Also, Dan, too, up in lacrosse there. Nice presentation. Thanks, Ron. Okay. Well, very good. Well, you know where Ken is if you have any more questions. And, uh, Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and uh, we will have out very shortly the February 
We have a couple of science uh, sharing webinars uh, during that time. So we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you.